Edmund E. Goodwin House next door is now open to the public on Saturday morning from 9 until 12. Uh, a lot of you I know have not yet visited. It's well worth your while. It's a beautiful, beautiful old house and the entire ground floor has been fully restored. And I am very pleased to make the announcement tonight that just three hours ago I had a call from the State Historic Preservation Commission in Augusta, who informed me that yesterday the National Park Service put the Goodwin House on the National Register of Historic Places. Very nice. right. oh. And now, without further ado, the lovely lady to my left, that you, Muriel. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a bit overwhelmed, aren't you? <laughs> Let me start out by saying that you don't cover a world trip or 90 years of life in 50 minutes. <laughs> and that was the hardest part of this assignment, was to try to encapsulate some of the things that I've done that would be of interest to you, because a lot of them are not of interest to you. They're just routine travel. So what I've tried to do is I've tried to pick out places in the world where I've been where something different happened, or I had an accident, or I lost my passport, yeah. which happened, and those kinds of things. That, the kind of thing that would be of interest to people rather than a travelogue. We are not having a travelogue. Uh. <laughs> and if any of you afterwards would like to have some questions, I will hang around and talk to you. But um, what we're doing is looking at some of the spots where I think we need to make some. Thank you very much, that's a big help. As most of you know, I was born and brought up in Springville. Came back to Springville when I retired and I fully intended to come back to Springville to retire. Uh, I went to uh, Notre Dame School for seven years and graduated from Hamlin School just down here, a straight shot down the street. And I remember graduation walking down this aisle. <laughs> graduated from Sanford High School, left and went to Mass General School of Nursing, graduated from there in 46, and was offered a job in Washington, D.C. because a former classmate at a nursing school had gone and gotten a job, told the director of nursing she had a friend who was graduating, and the director <coughs> of nursing invited her friend to come work for her, which I did. And I mention this because so much of my life has been under one word, and that's serendipity. I've been at the right place at the right time, and I've taken the advantage of the opportunity. And that's how I've happened to do all of this. And when I was in Washington, I started to have courses right away at Catholic University to finish my bachelor in nursing. And while there, I helped two nurses from the United States Public Health Service with the research projects that they were doing. And basically, they were following a head nurse around to see what the role of the head nurse should be. I mention this because it's very important. Later in the year, I've, I've seen my BS now, I went to a district meeting of the Nurses Association. And while there, one of the gals that I had helped came up and just chatted. And at the end of the chat said, how would you like to go to Damascus? <laughs> I said, Damascus, where's that? <laughs> Three months later, I was in Damascus. Uh, I was bedded and cleared and all of this kind of thing. And uh, left New York for Rome. Now, even this was a little bit different. I was not 30 years old yet. And I flew from New York <coughs> to Rome, first class, on a two-story 
PAA plane and went to one of the first class hotels in Rome. Hmm. I'll tell you how this developed, how this whole project developed. And I was put up in a first class hotel in Rome. <coughs> now, I really wasn't used to this kind of living. <laughs> <laughs> but what had happened, and I want to tell you how this uh, team got set up in Damascus. A little bit of history. Damascus ended up being a French mandate after the Second World War. And everybody in, in Syria, the government in Syria, ended up being very, very resentful of this mandate and the control of another uh, government. And they were not open to any kind of foreign assistance. So what happened, and I'm sure it still goes on, is the dictator of the country, his name was Shishekli, was in Beirut at the United States Embassy having drinks and got to talking to the head of the Ford Foundation and just casually mentioned that he hoped if he did nothing else in Syria, he would improve the level of education and the level of health care. And the guy from Ford Foundation, after all, he got all the money in the world, always says, we can help you with that. And there developed a health team that went to Damascus, obviously paid for by the Ford Foundation and the money. And I mention this because this led to so many things, and this is how, you, how my career has been in meeting people at different meetings, maybe participating and so forth, and you meet people, and the next thing you know, they're inviting you to Damascus. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I left Springvale uh, with many tears on the part of my mother, but she was a very strong supporter. And as an example, I just say this as an aside, the reason I've been able to get back to some of the events is I sent home carbon copies, I, I bought them, just happened to come across a little notebook that you could use, write, and it would be a carbon copy. And I kept a daily log, and every so often I sent a pile of them to my mother. She never threw one thing wow. away. <laughs> <laughs> so when I looked, started looking, to prepare for this, I had this whole notebook of over 100 pages of the logs that I had kept, mm -hmm. as well as the additional airmail letters that I had sent her. Now that should have facilitated things, but I had such a wonderful time reading all of this, <laughs> it's taken me days and days and days. So I'm going to give you a little taste of some of the things that I experienced. I landed in Damascus, and I had recruited a director of another nurse to go with me as director of nursing uh, of the operating rooms. And I was met at the airport and taken to the Katan Hotel, which was a first class hotel in uh, Syria, in Damascus. That is gone in a beautiful corner room with a balcony all the way around. And two days later, we had a coup d'etat. <laughs> and the dictator was thrown out of the country. <laughs> Which is why I, I think he ended up in France, the head of a munition plant or something. But we did have a war, which I was able to sit, observe from my balcony. We <laughs> <laughs> were we on the second floor and we could look down in front of the market to, to see what was going on. Well, I mention this because in the year that I was there, we had five coup d'etats. Wow. <laughs> and every coup d'etat meant a new government, mm -hmm. and a new minister of health, mm -hmm. and a new telephone call calling us to please come and meet the new minister. Mm -hmm. Now, we had five ministers in that year. Two of them were the same man, <laughs> <laughs> and his claim to fame to be Minister of Health, but he was the poet laureate of the country. <laughs> <laughs> and I kid you not, this is what we're not. And we would be called to go meet the minister. It got to the point where after the second time, I kept my white gloves and hat in my desk drawer. <laughs> they didn't tell you tomorrow or the next day. They told you at 11 o'clock this morning. Mm -hmm. And we went through this. 
another, another little element in all of this that we have to work in here is the second language in Syria is French. Arabic is the first and French is the second. I was the only one on our team who spoke French. So when we went to meet the minister, I was the translator, basically. I'm not sure there made a bit, big a di bit of difference because I don't think he had, he had made, bothered to listen to us at all. But we did have to go see the minister. It worked out, it worked out very well. <coughs> However, we're at about the third or fourth new minister of health. We started realizing that we were developing the hospital on paper, but we were getting very little support from the government to move this ahead so we could open it. <coughs> and we started getting the message that we didn't think we would accomplish much that year. And it got to the point by the end of maybe eight months that the um, <coughs> hospital administrator and I agreed that we would take three days off, not come to the office. By the way, going to the office was no problem because we had a driver and a, car and a chauffeur. <laughs> um, and we had Fridays off because that was the Muslim Sunday, and we had our own Sunday off. And half the time we had the Sunday off because the Greeks were having some, <laughs> <laughs> some celebration. Um, so I, I bring this out because politically we were dealing with a situation that was out of our control. We, had, we really couldn't do a thing about this. And we had nothing to do, the, the health team had nothing to do with the embassy. I mean, we visited the embassy, went to all their parties and all of that, but we were not under the government um, aegis, which made it difficult, but on the other hand, we were there. So, let me just look at, I don't, I don't want to talk too much about this because we don't have any time, but um, after the three days that we agreed to be apart, not go to the office, not to see each other, we had agreed that we would come up with a proposal about what we should do with this health team that we had there. And uh, we went back to work and met as a group and the hospital administrator and I had practically the same report and same recommendations, and that was to abort the project. Now remember, we had all given up jobs, closed apartments, houses, and everything else for a two-year <coughs> assignment in Syria. And we were even finishing one year at the point. But we knew that we'd be better off to go home without opening the hospital than to stay there and have them be able to say, see, the Americans were here and they couldn't do anything either. Mm -hmm. So we felt it was better to do that, uh, which we did. Now, while I was there, I have to tell you, it was a wonderful year. <laughs> Work-wise, professionally, uh, it was a little bit of a disaster, but in terms of life and culture and social life, it was a wonderful year. I, I went to uh, Jerusalem and I'll, uh, not yet, uh, Petra and several other places and was able to go to Cyprus for a week, used to go to Beirut for R&R &R and belong to a club there that had a pool and so So it really wasn't a very tough life. <laughs> and I put it the other way, it was a great life. Full-time maid, we were the only Americans who did not have a sleeping maid. And we didn't because we didn't have the extra room. We want, it did have, but it was the central room and it was used to ride the bicycle that we had sent over. <laughs> but we did re recommend that we leave and uh, I started on my trip, on my journeys. Uh, we went, one of the trips that we took was uh, P uh, Palmyra. And I'm including this because of what's going on in Syria today. And about a month ago, maybe five weeks ago, it was in the papers that ISIS had bombed mm -hmm. Palmyra. Well, Palmyra was an archaeological gem mm -hmm. of the ancient days. And you'll see some of these slides. That's what was there when I was there in, uh, in the 50s. What is left now, from what I can read in the newspaper, 
they they flattened the whole thing. I don't know that they have, but this is what I this is what I found out. And these were some of the ruins that I went to. This was uh, the entrance to the theater. These are the kinds of columns and ruins all over the place. No one was living there. I don't understand why the place was bombed because it was just ruins, archaeological ruins that were a gem in terms of history. And this is just our crowd. We had two, we drove two cars when we went there. Uh, it's just a, and this is a, just a sunset at Petra. And we leave that on for a minute because I think it's an unusual slide. And I'm afraid that this is all gone. Yeah. And I have no way of knowing at the moment. I'm sure someday we will, we will find. Uh, these, are, these are fish, glass, hand-blown fish from Damascus that the man on the street will make. And I brought a half a dozen, a half a dozen home. Uh, this is a kind of metal work that they do. And I, after traveling the Middle East, I, I was convinced that Damascus really had the best metal work of any place I saw it in the world. Beautiful pieces. And this is just a small piece. This I have to explain rather carefully. The head of this peacock unscrews and comes off and has a needle at the end. And what you have in the body of the peacock is paint. And you see the Middle East and Indian people with a red dot. Mm -hmm. or, well, the red dot has to be refreshed just like the lip lipstick. And at the end, you use the tip of that to freshen the, the <laughs> circle on your fo forehead. And they, most of them are red, but there are other colors. Uh, let me see. I, I just I have to have a few notes just so I don't go off too far off my uh, beaten track here. Um, Well, I've told you about the process of ending the, the project. It was really a rather sad experience. But then we had given three months to come home, and the gal who was in charge of the opera rooms and I spent it traveling home to Europe. So that was my first really extensive trip in Europe, which was a very good introduction for the later on when I was going to be traveling a bit more. I came back to the States, <coughs> waiting for a job, was waiting for me. I did apply for it, but I was called. And I went to Mass General in charge of in-service education. I came back in time to hit the biggest polio epidemic the world has ever known. <coughs> and in the job that I had, it was my job to train volunteers to help with the eye and lungs. How many of you know what an eye and lung is? Yeah. Oh, well, you're all a little older, I guess. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the last time I asked a group this, they didn't know what I was talking about. Yeah. But they were, they were young graduates. Uh, this is a typical, it was the ward, where I would take volunteers and teach them how to run the pumps. These are on electricity. And if the electricity goes off, the pump goes off, and the patient's breathing stops. These are breathing, each one of these is breathing for a patient. So they had to keep them going. And I remember having one full class of medical students from Harvard, and they had, they volunteered, because I'm not sure how much they volunteered, but they weren't paid anyway, is to run, had to teach them how to run the, uh, I am like, in case the, uh, the uh, power went off. Now, what you have at the end of, the, you can see the heads here, but on the other end, and you have a round thing like bellows. So, if the power went off, you had to use your hands and use the bellows to breathe for the patient. Because these patients who are in iron lungs were usually affected torso and from the waist up. So they could not breathe on their own. 
And this, these kept them going until they got a little bit of strength back in their, in their uh, chest and their muscles and were able to uh, breathe by themselves. It was, a, it was a very daunting situation to look out on a wall. This is one boy, by the way. One wing in the white building, which we saw a minute ago. And just full of eye lungs. Then you had the, the next step, which would be the, the uh, Kenny Packs. Anybody remember a Kenny Pack? <laughs> You're my age. <laughs> <laughs> and and when, when uh, patients were well enough, they were uh, treated with these very, very hot, heavy uh, packs that were applied to either a limb or a uh, uh, leg. And those were done by hand. You didn't have pharmaceutical supply in those days. And what you had to run the, the uh, penny packs through is you had a, a, a boiler on your <coughs> galvanized iron uh, tub, and you had these very heavy, heavy materials soaking in there. And you had, remember your mother's old fashioned wringer and the washer? Well, you had to put them through that because you had to get the excess water off and then they, you ran and applied them to somebody's leg, chest, whatever. Those two had to be run by volunteers at one point. And I could spend a lot of time on that because some, some people, I, I know one man who has a limp today and he was a product of that uh, uh, epidemic and a lot of people were. Uh, <coughs> Again, I was sitting in the office and I got a phone call. Would I come to Washington to see somebody to talk about a health team going to Costa Rica? And I said, no, I'm not looking for a job. <laughs> but would you come anyway? Just come and talk to us. I said, okay. Yeah. Your expenses are paid, who cares? <laughs> Take a couple of days to get out to Washington, which I did. And of course I took the job. <laughs> that happened to be a government health group. The United States government, USAID, anybody familiar with that? Mm -hmm. United States Aid to International Development. Mm -hmm. And that was being supported by the United States and going to Costa Rica. And that was going to be a health team. The whole uh, concept with them was to improve the level of health care in Costa Rica. Now, Costa Rica is a lovely, <coughs> lovely country. They refer to themselves as the Switzerland of Central America. And they were, you know, considering moderately advanced, they weren't, but they needed help in the, with the team. And they had a team already in Costa Rica helping throughout the country, but they soon realized that the main hospital of the country, the San Juan de Dios, which is a 1,200-bed hospital in the capital, was the main hospital of the country. And if, if they couldn't take care of somebody out in, in the boondocks and the health field, health station, they sent them into Costa Rica. So they realized, the team realized that they had to do something to uh, help that hospital. I went down as director of nursing, <coughs> two shots. First trip around the hospital, I saw two patients in a bed, for example. I saw five babies in the crib together. But, very ingenious, they had a, a routine, a procedure to make a bed for two patients. So you made a bed on the diagonal and one person opened from that end and the other one opened from this side. So they, they didn't touch really. And of course the babies were swaddled so that five in a big crib really didn't make that much difference anyway. Well, that was one of the things I noticed. And I was supposed to do an assessment of the whole hospital. Well, the hospital had a butcher shop. <laughs> it cut its own meat. In other words, when they needed meat, they went out and bought a cow. And they brought it into the butcher shop. And I knew a lot about a butcher shop, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but fortunately, the USAID program had a listing of some of the workshops that were held in the region, not necessarily in Costa Rica, but in the region 
and you could recommend and send people to these workshops. So I, in a hurry, sent the head butcher to the workshop so he could learn how to cut meat. But that was just an example of some of the things that were going on in, in, in the country. Uh, I did an assessment of the hospital, and that, that uh, project did last two years, and it was a very successful project. I left there to come back to uh, Colorado to do my master's. And on the semester break in uh, May or June, uh, my roommate and I, who had a, and we had a car, drove to San Francisco. All our friends were finishing their theses, but we had finished hours early, so we knew we were going to San Francisco. And we were walking around the square, is it St. Francis Square in San Francisco? Mm -hmm. We came across the Qantas Airline office. And we knew that next year, there was going to be a, con uh, the International Council of Nurses was going to be meeting in Japan. So we decided we were going to talk to Qantas about the cost of going to Japan, and then maybe going to, uh, to uh, New Zealand, because my roommate was from New Zealand before she came there to school. So we went in and talked to this gal, lovely, lovely gal, I can remember her name now. Her name was Fran, but I didn't get the last name. And she booked us sort of tentatively to go to New Zealand first, because we wanted to spend a couple uh, months at Brenda's house, and then coming back to the ICN in Japan. No, Melbourne. Melbourne. <laughs> Was Melbourne. it Melbourne? No, no, not yet. Okay. And that'll be the next trip to New Zealand. The first part was the Japanese one, so we went down and on the way out of the office she said, now you know, if you go to New Zealand, you can come home the other way at no extra cost. So to make a long story short, that's exactly what we did. So we, were, we made arrangements that next year to go to New Zealand, and we went on the way down. We made a couple of stops, and one of them was to Nauru, a country that is eight square miles in size, and is a country. And it's, uh, let me just see what things mean. It's a phosphate island. And when you, drop, when you fly in, you see this crater with this great big hole mm. in this island. And the residences in any population is on the edge, because there is growth on the edge. But the rest of the island, they're digging themselves out of existence, because their main industry is the shipping of phosphate to other states. Mm. Uh, now, they claim that much of this phosphate comes from bird droppings over the centuries. Now, I don't know how it is today, and I couldn't find out. They're still in existence, so obviously they haven't dug themselves out of the world yet. Uh, the next stop, and it was really, uh, the only thing I would say about uh, Nauru is they had their own airline, they were already producing wine. And when we left that day, we were given uh, our tray for lunch with a bottle of wine. I, I happen to like wine, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I mentioned that because I opened the bottle and I absolutely could not drink it. So I called the airline hostess over and I said, you know, this wine is bad. So she took it and brought me another bottle. And I opened that one. It was just bad wine. It was a bad bottle, it was a bad wine, and it was not drinkable. And I've never forgotten that because, ugh. Anyway, the next, uh, the next stop on our way to New Zealand was Ponape. And this is what you were greeted with in Ponape. Now this, by the way, these islands are the Micronesia. You know, halfway between Honolulu and, and Manila, that kind of thing. And, you're not apt to go, and as far as Nauru is concerned, if you plan, talk to me before you plan to go. <laughs> <laughs> the different, the one thing that was different about uh, about Ponape was this is our hotel room. 
<laughs> they were all thatch covered, like a motel, cottages, beautiful inside. I sat on the bed and I thought, oh my lord. I come to find out every mattress in the motel was a waterbed. <laughs> Which makes sense because there are no mattresses in Pompeii, and to ship mattresses in would have been terribly expensive. This way, this by the way was started by an American. This way, they shipped in the bladders, and all they had to do was fill it with water. Mm -hmm. and they had wonderful beds. It was a beautiful spot, really beautiful spot. Pictures and a little fuzzy. Is that you with your? I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Pictures yeah. a little fuzzy. Is that you and your fr your friend? <laughs> <laughs> no, but it was an interesting setup because they were individual cottages, and some of it, some of the walks were rock. But some of them were uh, planks because they were built in the middle of the bush. But the two Americans that started this really ha had a good vision, I think. They really had a nice spot. Um, was that part of, was that part of by any chance? It's all that both, both Nauru and Potapay are Micronesia Islands. Absolutely. Yeah. I was really sent to that one. We might have met up, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, our next stop is New Zealand. We spent, we spent over two, uh, two months in New Zealand. Uh, my first brother had gotten us a second-hand car, and we were very fortunate to be able to drive throughout the two islands. And it's a beautiful country. Uh, no particular accidents or anything happened there, so except for the scenery, uh, it was very worthwhile. We came back to New Zealand. Went to the, we did get to the Congress, by the way. I'm not going to tell you about that because you're not interested in a four-day council of, uh, of nurses. But we did go to uh, the meeting in, in Kanawala, I mean in uh, Melbourne. And from there, we went up to Brisbane and tried to get ourselves to a place out in the bush country in Australia called Kanamala, or Gilbreth Plains, which is out in the nowhere of Australia. And we were very fortunate to be able to do this because the head of the, this was a research station for the breeding of, of sheep, and the head of the station was a friend of my friends. So we were able to go and stay with them for about a week. We had to wait three days because there was school holidays and because everybody was in, in Brisbane going to school or the city is going to school because you had no schools to educate the kids out in, in, in the bush country. We went to the uh, Gilbreth to Connemal, which is a research station. Now keep in mind that lamb and wool are the main industries for Australia. This is very important to them. And this research station was set up strictly to see how many uh, sheep could be bred on a certain acreage. And there's very little growth to start with, and the only water comes out in bores. There no, there's no water except underground, and to get water, they put a bore down and you get a gushing of water. Even in the house, they, you know, they laid pipes and there was water going into the house. And the, and the drinking, the water out of the kitchen sink was brown. <coughs> so obviously you didn't drink that. <coughs> and, uh, oh, one thing I have to mention is when you ran the water for your tub, you filled the tub and then you had to wait for it to cool off so you could get in. It was boiling water that came out of the ground. I enjoyed Karamola because the first night out, I went out with the jingaroo on a kangaroo hunt. <laughs> they call it a roo hunt. I killed myself with kangaroo one. And I can see some expressions now. I have to tell you, the kangaroos are a pest mm. in Australia. So the jungaroos, the employees, would go out at night and they would kill as many kangaroos as they could. And for every two years, 
that they sent back to the research office in Melbourne, they got 50 cents. <laughs> so they were helping in terms of getting rid of a pest in the country because their interest was to make, make sure that what green was available was available to the sheep. And I did go out on several trips with, with some of the workers. And uh, how many of you have ever been on a sheep ranch? <laughs> did you help sort the sheep? Oh. Well, I got involved, of course. <laughs> I would have, and you, they're all numbered, they're all labeled, they've got you know, tags in their ears and so forth. So they're very, very careful. This is a research project, and they're very, very careful that they keep tabs on the sheep. And I went out helping them, and, and I had done this in New Zealand, so I wasn't really as green as they thought. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to spend any more time there. Oh, yes. Going back, we couldn't get a flight out of Panamola, and we had to take the train back to Brisbane, and it was a 24-hour train ride, which wasn't too bad considering everything. OK, then we left Panamola, and we went to uh, Port Moresby in New Guinea, Manila, Hong Kong, Saigon, when we went to Angle Wat, if you ever go to mm -hmm. that area, and Ceylon, which I call the uh, world of monkeys. Then we went on to India, to what I call the home of the sacred cow and the burning gas. But we spent probably a month in, in and out of India, because Benares was the kickoff point for when we wanted to go to Kathmandu and to Kashmir. <coughs> Am I keeping up with you all right? Yep. Okay. <coughs> now, we first went to Kathmandu. And I'll tell you about the living goddess in a minute. But we had a flyer from in Benares about the Sea View Hotel, which advertised a phone in every room, modern bath with hot and cold water, <coughs> and so forth. But, and we went. We got there. The phone was not only out of order, it wasn't connected. <laughs> <laughs> and the bath, and I have to help you visualize this. You visualize the old bathtub at home with a claw foot. Mm -hmm. And at one end of the bathtub was a little sand and sitting on the stand was a barrel with water. <laughs> and underneath the barrel, uh, the barrel was a propane light. And that was your hot and cold when you wanted. Oh. You, had, you had to light the, 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 the heater under the barrel and wait until the water warmed up, and that was your hot and cold. Oh. <laughs> Don't knock it, sometimes it's handy. <laughs> Uh, I'm trying to keep this in order here, just a minute. Okay, it wasn't very good, but we had a friend who was working in Kathmandu, who was living in here, and she had a nine-room house, and soon invited us to move in with her, which we did. <coughs> However, the nine rooms really worked out to four rooms upstairs, because every time it rained, the first floor was completely flooded. We <laughs> couldn't <laughs> use it. But it was all right with us because she had a bathroom upstairs, washer, dryer, and everything else. And we, we uh, really enjoyed staying with it. But because the, the, rains were common, you'd have, you'd have showers and it'd be so heavy that the ground couldn't absorb it and you had a first floor full of water. Now this was really the land of monkeys and prayer wheels. Anybody know what I'm talking about with a prayer wheel? All right. You do, all right. It was, they're all over the country. But when you went into town, for example, there'd be this, probably some of them as big as this room, with pieces of metal, all, all very intricate. And they were on a swirling pole. 
And the idea was that when you walk by, you just hit them like this and got them to turning. And supposedly, that brought prayers up to the heavens. So every time you went by, Pull, uh, twirl these things. Before I leave here, I want to tell you the most important thing about Kathmandu, and that's to tell you the story, the legend of the living goddess. Now, you meet a lot of this in the Asian countries, Eastern countries. According to the legend, the, go the goddess Kamari visited the king one day to teach him wisdom. But instead of being worshipful, he became lustful. <coughs> and she said that she would never again appear to man. However, because she was so merciful, she said that she would speak to them through a young goddess, a young, a young virgin, who had never known blood. <clears throat> and that could be a scar from a, a knee, or a cut, or, or menses. Right? And the thing is that when the incumbent became a woman, in other words, if she had got her menses, she was thrown out as the living goddess and it was time to select another goddess. <coughs> At that time, everybody, every goldsmith in the country has to bring their younger daughter to the uh, central place, uh, which is a big temple, uh, full of ugly uh, statues and everything else, very dark, and they're put in this place, and the idea is that the one youngster who does not cry or try to run out or anything, gets to be the new living goddess. Now this living goddess is protected like you wouldn't believe. She's carried, she's carried in a chair, she's clothed in gold material, and lives a life, life of opulence. And once a year, she comes out, and she goes around, and the king has to pay respect to her according to the original uh, goddess Kamara. Unfortunately, when the uh, current goddess knows blood, in other words, it could be a pet, but it could be a menses, she's thrown out. Absolutely <coughs> thrown out to oblivion. Because the process starts over again. And the poor thing, nobody will marry her, because the gods would get angry. So this happens every so much. We were lucky to be there when the goddess came out to pay, uh, so the king could pay respect to her. And, and, and this is a very serious thing, you understand. And a big, and a big uh, holiday and holy day. Okay, uh, we went, oh, I'm gonna have to rush a little bit. Um, back to India. Where are we next? Back to India and then on to Kashmir. Back to India, okay. And then on to... Ready? Kashmir. 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 Okay, we get back to Benares to go to Kashmir. Mm -hmm. This is wonderful. <laughs> we went from Benares to Kashmir. We were picked up by, a, I suppose we had it gone to a tourist uh, agent or something, and driven to our houseboat. We spent a week on the, on the river in a houseboat. Wow. We had a full-time house man, and attached a little way off was his family, who waited on us, cooking, everything else. And besides that, there was a shikari. Uh, what was that nice? This is our taxi. I mean, not usually this one, but similar to this. We had one for each each houseboat, and when we wanted to go someplace, we just called the shikari, like a cab, and we're, we're, wherever we wanted to go. Um, oh, hawkers! You think because you're on the on the river 
that you're not going to be bothered with people trying to sell you stuff. The minute we moved in, we were inundated with these hawkers coming in with their boats, and they had everything. I mean, they had metal things, they had toilet articles, they had flowers, and the flower boat was absolutely gorgeous, and the flower boat boy, his, his name was Marvelous. <laughs> <laughs> and the barber, cut, and I had him here, cut 50 cents, mm -hmm. and they also had the, the tailor. I did not have anything made, but one of the gals had uh, a blouse made. Like the Hong Kong suits, you know, you get everything overnight. That goes on everywhere but the United States, I think. <laughs> uh, oh, I have to tell you about the British picnic. Oh, the picnic. Uh, and then you can I'll do this. Yeah. To the um, we went out in our little Chicago, and the house, house man had another boat and took the picnic. We went to an island that was more of a park than some of the islands. Got out of the boat. He proceeded to spread a linen tablecloth on the ground. Took out the china, <laughs> the silver, then the samovar. And if you've ever used a samovar, you know that it's water. But inside, you put a large tube of charcoal. And you put that in the samovar, and that heats up the water for your tea. And rose petals all over the place. And so, so this is a picnic. The only part of it that's a picnic is you're sitting on the ground. <laughs> on the pillow. Right? <laughs> but lovely, always very good food. Uh, oh, well, very quickly, I'll just tell you, we had a couple of excursions out of our uh, houseboat. One of them was uh, to go to, we went as far as the Tibetan border. And that included not only a boat ride, but included horseback and car partway, and then climbing partway, <coughs> because it gets very hilly. It's the base of the Himalayas, and it gets very hilly in the end. We also went on a camping excursion. But the camping excursion was a bit like the camping tents that I went on in Kenya. Uh, they're, they're tents, but there's a bed and there's a lounge chair and everything else. It was a very nice experience, but it, w it really was tough travel. We had to ride both horseback and do a lot of uh, foot pedaling on our own. Uh, Well, I think because of time, uh, Go to Cairo. we're in Cairo. We did a little back peddling every so often. And at this point, we went to Cairo because uh, I wanted to see the stall in, in Mier for the at the pyramids. And if you've, some of you have been to Greece and so forth, you've seen the song and light, lights and songs for some of these uh, ruins. They're very, very dramatic, and they had one for the uh, uh, pyramids, and I wanted to see that, so we went back. However, the one thing that was interesting in Cairo was the uh, Cairo Tower, which is this. And you go to the top of that because it's such a beautiful view of the whole countryside. <coughs> now, it's fine. We had a lovely view, but coming down on the elevator, there something was wrong. It was very creaky, and first it was slow, and then it sped up a little bit, and to make a long story short, it did not stop at the first floor. <laughs> we went right down to the bottom, and fortunately they did have, I guess they all have, I've never, I've never looked at elevators that closely, but we did stop. We could not get the door open, and finally, one of the passengers took off his coat and used to get his you know, protection for his oh, managed to pry the door open, and we were about maybe three feet below the first floor. <laughs> and no one came, and no one came. So eventually, <coughs> between the men and whatever, all of us, we managed to get ourselves out of the elevator and onto the street. 
Nobody came. <laughs> the attitude of anybody around was malish. And I heard that all throughout my stay in Damascus. Who cares? Malish. Just went out of the way and went back to our hotel. If you had a voice or a service in Hong Kong? Well, I can't, I can't go mm -hmm. into one of, each one of these things. Where am I here? You're in Istanbul. Istanbul. Oh, okay. Stay in Istanbul for a minute. Okay. Uh, before we left India, we did everything you're supposed to do in India. <coughs> Went to the Taj Mahal, and don't let anybody tell you that it's hippie. You know, so many people say it's, it's glitzy, it's, a, it's gorgeous, as far as I'm concerned. I went in the evening to take some sunset pictures. I went in the middle of the night to take some moonlight pictures of it. And I went back at, s at sunrise to take some. It is an absolutely extraordinary building and it is really worth seeing. Uh, we did visit Mahatma Gandhi's cremation spot. Uh, not an awful lot to talk about there. It's just that we felt we should go. And ended up, in, as far as India was concerned, with the fact that it is the land of the holy cow. There's no doubt about it. And my last impression of India was going down this main drag and going by a park and there was a cow. And I mean, this is holy cow country. And a man was standing behind the cow. The cow was urinating and he was sprinkling himself with the urine. <laughs> well, but this goes on all this. This is the holy cow country. You don't hurt them, you don't kill them, you don't eat them or anything else. And this went on everywhere you went. And, and, and another little aside is that um, it's so holy that if you build a new home, you collect cow dung and make patties out of it, let it dry, and put it in your walls to bless the house before you move in. <laughs> you can keep it, but that's all right. <laughs> um, we went back to Damascus on this trip because I wanted to see my friends. And we went back to Jerusalem because uh, my friend Greta and the fellow that we picked up along the way had never been to Petra. So while they went to Petra, I, I sat in a mine and uh, enjoyed myself. Uh, just a word about the stop in, in uh, Damascus. It goes back to my visit when I was there ten year, seven years before. We looked at my former Arabic and such a Mr. Jose, and they invited us to move in with them, which we did. However, the night before we were leaving, Mr. Jose was telling me that the previous time before I, when I was there, and I'd stayed with him a few times, uh, he had been hauled off to jail the next day after I left. <coughs> he was suspect to start with because he worked for the United States Embassy as a translator. And he had me as a student once a week for all the time I was in Damascus because I studied Arabic. I could speak Arabic at one point, but kitchen Arabic, you know, going to the shopping and so forth. And she told me that she was sure that after we left the next day that the same thing would happen. And I, I was never able to confirm that because I never heard from them again. Uh, but this is pretty much the way the, the country was run. Um, we left, uh, I think, excuse me just a bit to make sure. I'm skipping some of the things because I know the time is running out. Um, Oh, well, what, another little interesting thing. We did go back to Jerusalem. When we went to Petra, went to Jerusalem for a few days. And I'd been there before. And we joined the group that was going to start the Way of the Cross, the Via de la Rosa. And you go in a group, of course, which we did. And about the third Way of the Cross, I looked over to my friend, and she had no purse for the so we had to go back to the start of the Via de la Rosa. And obviously, the guide 
knew what we were talking about. But all he kept saying was, police, police, policia. And we didn't understand exactly what he was trying to say until somebody came up and talked to him. And what he was saying, is he had the purse, but he would not give it to us until a, a tourist police was present to show that he did give it back to us. He was very honest and he took care of it. But you don't lose your purse when you're doing this kind of travel because your passport is in it. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have a passport, you've got a problem. Mm -hmm. And it happened to me when I first went to Damascus the first time. Somebody stole my purse and uh, I told somebody at the embassy about it. And she says, oh, Ambassador Moose will be awfully upset. And I said, Ambassador Moose will be upset. Where do you think I am? <laughs> And you can get them replaced and get a temporary one, but your passport is your ID and you better have it with you at all times, believe me. Mm -hmm. uh, we're in Istanbul, right? Yeah. I'm not going to spend much time here, but one of the highlights was the boat up to Bosphorus. It, it was just magnificent to see all of these buildings on both sides. One of the interesting parts of it is you stop, make some stops, and I asked for directions to San Antoria, which was one of the stops that we should see. And oh yes, they, they always understand. They understand the first word you, first word you mention, and after that, it's anybody's guess. <laughs> well, we took the directions, and we ended up at the sanatorium. <laughs> <laughs> So one of the reasons we took this boat trip is we were going to, and I have to start of semi spell it up, Uskurdar, U S K U R D A R, and that's important to all of you who are nurses because that's Tudari, where Florence Nightingale spent so much time and made a name for us, really made a name for herself. We don't know it but she was one of the original advanced statisticians in the world and was in the Crimea, but we had to go. It was, a, it was just a pilgrimage. And after that, we decided that we'd better get to more civilized, well, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> more uh, familiar. What? More familiar. More familiar mm -hmm. uh, culture. And so we went from there to Greece and then went up through Europe. And I'll, uh, I'm gonna finish that with a story about uh, in uh, Samoa. But one of the things that we did is that we landed in, uh, at some point in Rome, and had a friend there for an apartment with the room for us, and we moved in with her and sort of had some breakdown time because we've been traveling to the cultural shock, I think, more than anything. And we were tired of going to the airports and in those days, you dressed to go to the airport. Well, you didn't dress dress, but you didn't wear jeans by any means. And we were tired of this, so we decided we'd buy a car. I didn't have the money, but I rode home and borrowed $500. And we bought a 500 Fiat. <laughs> Lovely car. <laughs> And the minute we got it, we started north and went north of the Arctic Circle because winter, this was fall now, and we were afraid of the winter, so we thought we'd better get north of the Arctic Circle and then start down to see the rest of the Europe uh, when it was, wasn't quite as cold. I had a wonderful time, sent the Fiat home, and took it with us to Kentucky when we went down to work in, in Kentucky. My, la my last thing and I'll, I'll do with this in a hurry is uh, on one of my other trips, because I started, I retired early with the idea of traveling, and I did. And one of my trips, I went to, uh, I taught at uh, a university in, Mel in uh, south of Melbourne in a town called Heidelberg, of all things. And on the way home, I stopped in Samoa. And Samoa's you know, quite advanced and you no know, backwarders there. But the next day, I took a tour, a two night tour, to one of the outer islands. 
and got to the island, and got to the hotel, and I have to describe it to you. It's about, it was about as big as this room, and um, one room, and uh, built-in bunk beds all around. <laughs> And there was a facility for women here and a facility for men there. And that was the hotel. <laughs> it was owned by the chief. It was a thatched roof hotel. And I met up with an, uh, another lady. There were a lot, a lot of single travelers in, in the time I was gone. And I met up with the, another lady from the States. And we took a walking tour on the island. Went to the health station. There was a little general store and a school, and nothing much else. So, we'll, you don't have to stay because you've seen it one day. So we came back, <laughs> and I went back to the hotel where I was. And in the, uh, waiting for the air, airline, the airplane in, in uh, this island, I got to talking to a man and wife and his, the two children, because they were waiting for the plane to go back to uh, Samoa as well. So we went back to the hotel, and as I came down after cleaning up and getting ready for dinner, I went along the uh, patio where the uh, uh, cocktail party was. Got to talking to the same people, and they invited me to join them for dinner, which I did. Went into dinner, nice restaurant, and we were seated around a square, which was obviously the show floor, or the dance floor on the show floor, because there was going to be a big show after dinner. Lovely show, local music, so forth. And the last act, in the piece de resistance, if you will, was a sword dancer. And I was sitting just like this at the table, and he really jumped all over the place, and his last big jump was blindfolded, squatted down on the floor, and with his sword went along the floor. And I felt something, and I thought one of the youngsters had just inadvertently kicked me. And I looked down, and I'm bleeding. <laughs> he connected with the whole arch of my foot. Oh my God. Wow. Well, with a lot of napkins and pressure, uh, they carried me downstairs, this was the second floor, to the front of the hotel. And I'm sitting on the steps waiting for the uh, ambulance. And a, cu a couple came along, Americans, and told me that it would take me 15, 15 or 20 minutes for the ambulance to get there. And they had a car, could they take me to the emergency room? And I said, sure. And they drive up with a Volkswagen Beetle. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sitting on the seat in front with my foot up on the platform. But they got me to the, get this, the emergency room at the Lyndon Bays Johnson Tropical Medical Center Hospital. <laughs> A very, very modern hospital. So they put me on a stretcher and wheeled me into what looked like a, uh, the surgical suite. And I'm on my back and in walks this, this good looking man with gray, almost white, frizzy hair, a flowered shirt, we call it a Hawaiian shirt, but it's the same thing, and a sarong down to his feet, which were bare. Here's my surgeon. <laughs> what are you going to do? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> pretty soon, another gentleman comes in, shirt and tie, suit, all. He'd been at the, uh, at the show, so he'd fallen us over to the hospital. And he says, I'm whatever his name was, and I'm the head of this hospital. And we'll take good care of you. And he says, this is Dr. So-and-so, and don't worry, he was trained in New Zealand. He's one of the best. I had 17 stitches. And they told me to stay off my feet for a couple of days, so I went back to the hotel. And I remember my brother's here someplace. I called, he was working in Auburn, and I called him 
and he said, I'm coming in tomorrow, yeah, yeah. Can you meet me? And his response, I don't know if you remember, says, now what? I wasn't supposed to walk on it. Well, to end the story, I had to go to the, I belonged to the Harvard Pilgrim plant at the time, and I went there to get the stitches out, and everybody and his uncle in that Harvard Pilgrim plant walked through where I was because they couldn't believe the story that was going on. <laughs> <laughs> but funny. it came out all right. <laughs> Did you rate the hospital for them? Huh? Did you rate the hospital? <laughs> no, I, no. I would imagine from looking at the emergency room there was a good hospital. It was you anyway, you know. And uh, it looked as if it, they really knew what they were doing. And if he was trained in New Zealand, which he probably was, New Zealand has a very good level of health care. So that, that wouldn't worry me at all. Um, and your foot's still there. Huh? Your foot is still My there. My foot's still there. Yeah. You have to look very, very hard to see just a little line. And the 17 stitches worked well, and they, they uh, it never bothered me. So. I'm going to stop here because we've been an hour, and uh, all I can say is, if any of you have any questions, I I'm willing to stay and just discuss anything. And even later, if you plan to go to any of these places, uh, call me and I'll either share pictures or uh, I do have a lot of photo albums. I'll go with them. I'll, I'll go with them. <laughs> <laughs> Center have been working, they, they did the whole slide thing, and, and I want to go back to this before we, we leave. Uh, and it was hard because I had to read through a hundred pages of notes to my mother <laughs> on the log, mm -hmm. and had to pull out a few things because you don't cover a year's travel in a 15 minute, you know, 15 minute session. So they, they deserved an awful lot of recognition, and there were a couple of other people that were... Who else was with us in some of this? Well, the Chardonnay. <laughs> <laughs> the Chardonnay was a big help. <laughs> now, I just want to go over this with you very quickly. This is one wall in my sitting room. I can point with my little arrow here if you want. Okay. To well, so why don't we start at the right hand? Yeah. Oh. You've seen that. That is a miniature of the card they use to collect the coffee. Okay. The left, no, the left side is a hand-tooled leather bottle. We can go down the right hand, right side. Uh, oh, that. Those are one of my favorite belongings. No, 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 let me get to the big pictures, and then you can do it easier. Give me one second. I have a lot of picture slides, okay. by go. the way. Yes, if maybe. any of you plan to go anyway and you want to know <laughs> slide. Now, this is a uh, Madonna uh, from a New Zealand artist. This is you. I, this is, these are one of my favorite belongings. The two ballerinas that I bought from a street wood carver in Cuba. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And they are absolutely gorgeous. <coughs> and I think I must have paid $4 for the two of them. Oh, beautiful. They're beautiful and they're beautifully done. Mm -hmm. You saw the fish from Damascus by then. Huh? Yeah, I saw the fish from Damascus. Where? 
No. Oh, no. no. This, you, this you probably know. It's a Yadro. Tell, tell where you got that. Why you have that. Don't laugh at me. Tell them. <laughs> See, they know some of the things because they helped put this together. <coughs> this was given to me. I spent six summers going to Barcelona and I helped them start a master's program in nursing administration. And this was given to me by the first mm. class of graduates of that program, mm. okay. which, is, which is a Yadro, an original Yadro, beautiful thing. That is a bottle from Peru. It uh, was, I got it in a liquor store. It, it, held, a, it, it held Pisco. And the drink in Peru is Pisco Sours. A little like whiskey sours, only the pisco. That's a hand tool leather bottle. Mm -hmm. I saw that earlier. That's a. Uh, oh, I didn't tell you. Uh, we could spend all night here. Keep <laughs> going. <laughs> when I started on my world trip, I decided that I would collect one mug from every country I visited. Well, that was all right for the first six or seven, but by the time I got to ten, it was not a practical thing to collect. So show them the bracelet. What? Show them the bracelet. Oh. So instead of collecting mugs, I changed the coins from each country. Oh. And I had them put on a chain. There you go. Oh. I think there are about 45 here, but I've got six or seven at home that I haven't gotten around to yet. Mm. <laughs> But I did get about 10 mugs, and that was one from Jerusalem that you mm. just saw. <laughs> that happens to be, I think, the wall in my bathroom. <laughs> I have one wall in my bathroom that is two postcards from every place I've been to since I retired. Uh -huh. All of these. How long ago did you retire? A long time. A long time. <laughs> <laughs> 25 years ago. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I intentionally retired young. young I took the only retirement because I wanted to travel. Mm -hmm. And I did. Sure. All right. Um, mm -hmm. The woodwork here is all from New Zealand. From a, mm -hmm. All right. Up above here, we have a, a Blanco glass. Yeah, Blanco glass from West Virginia. Mm -hmm. And um, the other things that are awards and so forth, so it doesn't matter. Oh, just awards, nothing. Uh, you're probably familiar, what are you saying? It's just, just awards, award, just awards. <laughs> uh, you're probably familiar, some of you probably have one, the uh, 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 hatchet man, the woodcutter from oh. Oberammergau, Germany. No, I don't have one. And how about the taller one to the left? That one, what is that one? That Which one does the arrow on it? That's the Madonna. That's Madonna. That's Madonna. That's Madonna. Oh, that's it. Okay. Okay. Yep. Yep. Beautiful. And most of them live the, the glass fish, China. Beautiful. My mother. Your mother. Yeah. <laughs> and then I did. I did end up with about fifteen uh, mugs. mugs. <laughs> oh, okay. One from each country. What about the little dish that dates before Christ on there? It's underneath here. We can oh, it's under the chair. Oh, it's under. Okay. Oh. I have a um, plasma nova, so she's seen it. I have one of the you know what an oil lamp. Mm -hmm. I have a pre-Christian oil lamp mm. that I'm. Looking maybe the Hassan uh, Museum in uh, an or and in one or something, mm. but it's, uh, it's it's very precious because mm. you know it's so old. Mm -hmm. So you had this wall built in your no. home. No, you know what? When I bought my condo, it was there. Oh, <laughs> well, it must have been built for me. It was. It was built for you. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Unless you've got some urgent questions. Mm -hmm. This is it. <laughs> <laughs>